Tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Scott Terrell, is the Director of Animal and Science Operations for Walt Disney Parks and Resorts worldwide. Dr. Terrell received a doctorate in veterinary medicine from the University of Florida and came to the Disney Company and specifically Dis Disney's Animal Kingdom as a veterinary pathologist back in 1999. Today, he leads a team of more than 700 animal care professionals, educators, scientists, and veterinarians at Disney theme parks and resorts all around the world. Tonight, Dr. Trell will be telling us about his team's mission of connecting guests to the magic of animals and nature, while at the same time, working to conserve natural resources for the future. It is with great pleasure and great excitement that I welcome to the stage, Dr. Scott Terrell. Thank you, Zach. I'm gonna make sure I share my screen here. So hopefully I did that right, Zach. And uh, with that- Looks good. Okay, with that, um, good evening, everyone. I'm very excited to uh, share some stories and some learnings Scott, with you. Yeah. Hang on one second. It looks like okay. all of your icons are showing in the bottom. You might need to- uh -huh. I wonder how I, all right, what'd we do wrong here? So, we get there better. We go. There we yep, go. Perfect. Sorry, about, right, sorry, sorry about, about that. that. Couldn't go off. Couldn't go off perfectly there. Um, so uh, I'm excited to share some stories with everyone tonight, and I, I'm thankful for Zach, um, a good friend, for inviting me to to share some of our stories about. Um, our team, Disney's Animal Science and Environment, and hopefully I will entertain you tonight and also uh, perhaps share with you some information you're not aware of uh, with regard to uh, the Disney company, um, our presence in Central Florida, our presence around the world, and then our role as an accredited zoo and aquarium in, in uh, making, making a difference for our planet and our own backyard right here in Florida. So with that, I think I'll just go ahead and sort of expand upon Zach's introduction a little bit. I am a Florida Gator born and bred, um, if you can't see behind me on the wall there, and um, essentially uh, grew up in South Florida. I grew up in Western Fort Lauderdale out in a place called Plantation on the edge of the Everglades and grew up fishing and uh, hiking and doing all sorts of things when I was a youngster down there. Uh, I've really never left the state of Florida. Um, did a short stint with the National Park Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but essentially have spent my entire life here in Florida and enjoying our, our beaches and our waters. And I'm happy and excited to share that with my family, which includes my wife and our two young boys. And so um, my Disney journey, as Zach said, really began uh, in my role as a veterinarian. And ab about 23, 20, almost 24 years ago, coming down to this brand new theme park here in Orlando called Disney's Animal Kingdom as a, as a veterinarian and spending a lot of time behind a microscope there. And um, the company providing me some really amazing opportunities as a veterinarian, that elephant in the picture there is very much alive and asleep and, um, um, and is part of some translocation work that was being done in Southern Africa at the time. And my role with Disney has allowed me to engage both my scientific interests, um, but also my interests in teaching and interacting with our guests, which of course is a big part of what this company is about. And then uh, about six years ago, I was given the opportunity to move into an executive position with the company and um, take on a, on a pretty significant leadership role. And I'll introduce you to my team much more in depth as we go tonight. Um, but in that experience as a, as a Disney executive and a Disney leader, been part of some pretty amazing projects, including you know, the creation of another world right here, Disney's Animal Kingdom there, uh, Pandora, the world of Avatar, um, which if you haven't visited, I certainly encourage you to visit us. It's, it's an amazing place. So um, this is essentially the slide that we live by um, on our team. So my official title is the Director of Animal and Science Operations. And um, on our team, we really truly celebrate and share the magic of nature with our guests. And we live by a four word mission. And it's simple, 
by nature and by intent, the four words that mean so much to us, lead, care, connect, and conserve. And there are, there are intervening words, as you can see there, lead Walt Disney Parks and Resorts to care for animals, to connect people to nature and conserve our natural resources. But it really comes down to lead, care, connect, and conserve. We strive as the Disney company to be the leaders in anything we do. And amongst our team, we want to lead our profession. We want to be leaders in our community and leaders in our company. Um, we care deeply for the animals that are in our care here. Um, I'm sitting in my office here at Disney's Animal Kingdom and I can hear some of my night team out beyond, the, beyond my door at work right now. Uh, we care deeply for our cast, we care deeply for our community. Um, our job is to connect people to animals in nature. Um, the reason we have these animals here at Disney's Animal Kingdom and over at the seas is so that we can work with those animals to inspire our guests to help us make the world a better place. And if we're going to make the world a better place, we have to conserve our natural resources, um, both the animal resources, our habitat resources, and our environmental resources. And I'll touch a bit on each of those as we spend some time together tonight. Our vision is that Walt Disney's legacy for caring for animals and the environment is a way of life for our parks and resorts and our guests. And with a global company, with a truly global company like the Walt Disney Company, we have the ability to reach billions um, through our theme parks, through our resorts, through our television networks and movie studios. We have an immense opportunity and therefore an immense responsibility to try and do things right and to try and do things well. And we want to, um, I should have said, you'll never hear a talk from a Disney executive without hearing a quote from Walt. And, and certainly tonight will be no exception to that. Because what we're really trying to instill in people with this vision is our legacy as a company with nature and animals. And it's interesting because sometimes when I go and speak to veterinary groups or I go and speak to, I, I spoke to a, an MD group recently, um, and I said, you know, what's this guy up here talking to us about Disney and animals? And, and I believe, I, I would bet there's a few folks on this lecture tonight that, that remember um, the older days of the Disney company and some of the classic days of the Disney company. Some of you may have even spent your Sunday nights with Walt there on the left. Um, we wouldn't do that anymore with the tiger, but uh, with Walt there on Sunday nights and Sunday night television, um, with Walt and his family's true life adventures, really the first nature documentaries um, that were out there in the popular entertainment world. Um, some of you remember the early days of Bambi and Snow White and 101 Dalmatians. And, and it was actually Walt Disney and the animators that were the first to bring live animals in as the subjects of their art to capture the realism and the, and the natural behaviors of these animals. And so animals in nature truly are ingrained in our company. And that's what we're, we're trying to leverage um, on our team is this massive power and responsibility. And in fact, Walt himself said, animals in the natural world are as important to the legacy of our company as Snow White and Mickey Mouse. And Anytime we have a new cast member join our team, um, or in some cases when they leave our team, they get a small plaque with this ingrained on it because this is really what we're about and what we're trying to achieve. So it means a lot to us as leaders um, and members of this community. So there's a lot on this slide, but it's probably the most succinct way to introduce my team before I start with some facts and figures, before I start telling you stories. And I'll, I'll expound upon uh, some of the facts and figures on this uh, slide here. But um, starting at the top there, you, again, you see our mission lead care, connect and conserve. Uh, we care for approximately 300 species of animals. Um, in our various sites around the world, mostly in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, that equates to somewhere between five and thousand, five and eight thousand animals, depending on if you count every little fish and every little invertebrate. Um, so on the upper end, that could be eight thousand animals, but we, we go at the lower end, the five thousand. We, um, that 8.6 million guests connected annually, okay, that is not an attendance figure. I'll be very careful to share that is not an attendance figure. Um, but that is the number of people that we actually have individual animal and nature conversations and experiences with each year. 
So just in, in my business alone, not including our media networks, our, our movie networks, um, just in our business where we interact with, engage with guests on a daily basis, we have about eight and a half million interactions every year talking about animals and nature. We've raised more than $100 million to support conservation, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. Uh, we've placed tremendous focus on uh, natural resource con conservation, and solar is a very visible component of our um, focus. And in fact, as you can read right there, we actually have enough solar capacity here at Walt Disney World to power about eight equivalents of a Magic Kingdom theme park. And, um, and then for our team itself, um, reporting to me, there are about 750 people. And in total, we have about 900 cast members that are members of our animal science and environment team. And they span the range of, of endocrinologists, behavioral scientists, professional educators, nutritionists, veterinarians, um, and on and on and on. And so it is quite a dynamic team. Um, a lot of people much, much smarter than I am, and, uh, and now I believe I'm kind of the classic conductor of the orchestra, where I, uh, I sit at the top and I watch everybody else do all the hard work and all the smart work, and, um, and my success is their success. So, um, so that's a, just a little bit about our team, and we'll go into more detail uh, from that perspective. Um, they're right there at the bottom. Um, we mentioned that we're accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and we have been so for more than 25 years. I wanted to take a moment just to call out that that accreditation um, and that symbol that you'll see there on the right hand side, Association of Zoos and Aquariums, is a symbol of excellence. If you do visit zoological or aquarium based institutions, it's a, it's a way to know that you're supporting um, amongst the top institutions. Um, through an accreditation process. And so we're very proud of that. And we always try to highlight that when we talk to, to new audiences like yourself. And if anything that I say tonight is, is interesting to you, or if, if you find it entertaining or intriguing in any way, um, here is the social media and, uh, and, and internet capabilities uh, that you can go to and uh, learn more about our business, read stories from me on a weekly basis um, that that um, Instagram there, Dr. Mark, that's my boss, um, the vice president, and uh, he's also a veterinarian and an, an amazing guy. So, so if you're interested in what we, what we talk about tonight, there's some ways to continue on the journey with us into the future. So let's get into a little bit more of the fun and, and the interesting part of it. And uh, versus just telling you uh, the locations that we support around the world, I wanted to show you some pictures. And um, again, I'm, I'm hoping that many of you have visited us over the years or will visit us in the future. And um, so this is Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge, which is one of the facilities that I support. Um, there are about 300 animals at this facility and it's an amazing place because you can literally wake up with giraffe and wildebeest and uh, eland as in this picture and, um, and enjoy your hotel stay not too far from Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park. And so it is an amazing place. Uh, with amazing architecture and, and some museum facets as well. Uh, the Seas with Nemo and Friends over at Epcot Center um, is our aquarium facility, still one of the largest aquariums in the world at almost 6 million gallons of water and um, you know, creates very exciting experiences for our guests, opportunities for education and inspiration. And uh, we're able to leverage the very powerful franchise of Nemo um, to tell that story to uh, families with young children in many cases. Something that a lot of people may not anticipate or be aware of is um, also at Epcot Center, we have Living with the Land. And Living with the Land is an agricultural based experience at Epcot Center where we share with people the story of where food production and plant production comes from. And uh, so this is a component of my team. It's a little different focus on care. We're caring for plants and not animals, but it's all in the same realm. And uh, this just happens to be some pictures from Christmas where we decorated. It's a beautiful place at Christmas to visit, but it's an interesting place at any time. So if you're interested in agriculture or, or food science or, um, or uh, pest management, um, in this case, we have a lot of really cool integrated pest management technology in this facility. I encourage you to visit the land, uh, living with the land someday when you come to Epcot. Uh, 
just broadening on the diversity of our animal care opportunities here at Walt Disney World. We also are responsible for our equine programs, our horses. Uh, some of you may know that Walt Disney was a big horse person himself. And one of the first cast members that were hired here at Walt Disney World in Orlando was actually the ranch manager many, many, many years ago. Um, so our ranch team continues to be part of our heritage and we use horses in a variety of ways still on Main Street at Magic Kingdom and many many weddings where the bride arrives to the wedding in their own horse-drawn Cinderella carriage so uh, that's our team uh, as well and then we have a worldwide presence in addition to the presence here in Orlando we have uh, horses at Disneyland out in California we have some horses in Paris um, over in Europe, our cruise line business, and a resort in Hawaii that we also have some responsibility for. So uh, with our cruise line, we do have a Stingray interactive experience um, there, and uh, that is my team that facilitates that Stingray experience where we can share the wonders of the ocean over there in the Bahamas and a swim-through experience at our resort in Hawaii. So you may notice that I left out one rather important location, and that's the location where I'm sitting now. And uh, the reason why I left it out is because I wanted to save it for last because rather than me introducing it to you, I wanna let um, the power of our media networks introduce you to Disney's Animal Kingdom. This is the coolest place in the world. Go behind the scenes with an all-access pass to Disney's Animal Kingdom. We want people to be able to get as up close and personal as they can. The fun is just beginning. <laughs> Opening door nine. There he is. Hello. All the work that we're doing is making a difference. Just really a big team effort. I'm hoping that she might be pregnant. Yes, that's what People have no idea how much goes on behind the scenes here. We don't have favorites, but if we did have favorites, Augustus is probably mine. <laughs> oh, I love him. I love him so much. I would like to think she thinks that we're best friends, but she's a giraffe. <laughs> Anything else to say or can we keep going? <laughs> Welcome to a place. Our guests got to come and see an hours old gorilla. That's the kind of thing that's gonna make people want to do something for these animals in the wild. We're wonder. He's humongous. Hey, buddy. You look so good up there. Meets the wild. That was awesome. People are going to have a one-of-a-kind experience that they'll never get ever again in their lifetime. <laughs> National Geographic's Magic of Disney's Animal Kingdom. So that truly was not meant to be an advertisement for Disney Plus or National Geographic. It was just, I, I can't really do a better job of introducing uh, this place that I'm sitting at tonight um, than our television producers did for me. And I think it really captures a lot of what I'm gonna share with you for the next several minutes about what motivates us and what drives us and does it in a very beautiful way. So with that, I'm gonna fall back again on our mission because it's what I tend to do as I share with you some of the details about our team and how we, we care for the animals here um, in Orlando and also for our environment uh, here and around the world. So that lead care, connect and conserve, again, is, is what drives us. And ultimately, I tell my team, our job is to make the world a better place. And we believe that very strongly that we have that ability and it starts right here. Um, the real question is, you know, how do we make the world a better place? How do we, you know, I work at a theme park, I work at a zoo or an aquarium, um, but we believe that there is so much more um, to that and we're so very proud of the work that we do. Um, and, you know, this is, this is how we do that. We, we, we take really good care of our animals, we take really good care of our guests and our cast. Um, and we really strongly focus on conservation. And we know that if we do these two things right, um, we can be successful. We can make the world a better place. These two pictures mean the world to me and they capture so much about um, who we are and what we hope to achieve. The picture on the left, a, a white rhino, um, the hand of its caretaker, the hand of a professional who's dedicated his or her life to their care um, here at Disney's Animal Kingdom. 
someone who is passionate about saving rhinos in the wild and that connection that we have with them from a caring perspective um, is, is at the core of who we are. And then that picture on the right that captures in our aquarium, this interaction between a child and a sea turtle and hopefully inspiration of wonderment and a desire to protect our oceans. And so these two pictures, if I had, if I had only one slide to show to you, um, this would be it. And this is what, what motivates and drives us. And, uh, and they're pretty pictures as well. So, but luckily I have lots more pictures to share with you. So there's one other piece to it, and I've alluded to it a couple times, and you know, here's my second Walt Disney quote. Um, there's one other piece to how we will make the world a better place. And, um, and Walt said it best himself, you can design and create and build the most wonderful place in the world, but it takes people to make the dream a reality. And that's where I'm, I'm so very proud and always take a moment to recognize our cast members that uh, you know, do create the magic for us, that do the hard work, that that cry the tears, that, you know, um, sweat the sweat, that deal with the heat here in Florida and uh, the cold the last couple of weeks. And so it's the cast members that take care of the animals and educate our guests and, and perform medical care and reach out to the community and, that, and approach diverse audiences that really do make a difference um, in our world. When we talk about care and conservation, I always think about care in the context of animals first, the animals come first. And we try and we really try strongly to align to that philosophy any opportunity we have and at every opportunity we have. And so whether it's the medical care that we provide or the choices that we give our animals or the level of care on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's, there's, I know those pictures on the screen here are small in some cases, depending on the device you're watching it, uh, there, but um, uh, right there in the middle, there's somebody there in a green shirt. I don't know if my pointer will show up on your screen, but there's somebody there in a green shirt actually performing uh, a cardiac ultrasound of one of our gorillas. And we were one of the first institutions in the world to perform this in an awake gorilla um, to monitor as they age for evidence of heart disease. The bird right below there, a Micronesian kingfisher, and one of the largest breeding populations in a zoo of this highly endangered species from the Pacific region of the world. Uh, a zebra over there getting a routine hoof care. Um, zebras are just like horses, um, just have a lot more attitude. And so you're not gonna do hoof work on them awake most of the time. Uh, sea turtle rescue and, and tiger breeding and um, just on and uh, on and on. And I, I can never forget our horse, our ranch hands there that take really great care of our horses. So our, our theme is animals first and, uh, and how we can make sure that they get the best possible care. Um, a glimpse into our hospital and, and if you do watch our television show on, Disney's, on Disney Plus, um, this hospital is in almost every episode. This is where I grew up sort of kind of uh, for the last 24 years. And so it's near and dear to my heart, but our hospital uh, was the first hospital at any zoo in the world to be entirely what we call on show for our guests. So if you visit Disney's Animal Kingdom, you can come back to the back portion of the park and you can see our veterinarians at work. Um, this is what our hospital looks like. There are no drapes, there are no curtains or blinds. When we walk into the hospital, we are on show for our guests. And the idea behind that is that our care is transparent. So if we have an injury or an illness or a baby or a C-section or whatever it is, that we're able to share the level of care, the level of passion, the level of dedication, the successes and sometimes the failures that are us caring for our animals. And so this is the view that you will have if you come to our hospital. Um, and to make sure that you know I'm telling you the truth. Um, here's some pictures kind of from the other direction. So um, that's a lion on the table. His name is Dakari. And um, that is the, the, the taller gentleman in blue there is actually a veterinary dentist. It's come in to do a little teeth work on Dakari, clean up his teeth a little bit. And you can see he's doing that to a, a, a pretty great audience there in the background. And Laura there is running anesthesia and running some of the imaging there. Laura is one of the technicians in the green and the blue there. Um, and so it is an amazing place to practice medicine. It is an amazing place to tell stories and share messages. 
a um, little pressure once in a while, and uh, but that's okay because all of our team recognizes the value of that little boy or that little girl in the orange and black or in the pink or over there in the red, seeing and being inspired by what we do. And I would like to think that over the last 24 years of our existence and the millions of guests that have seen us at work in this hospital, that we've inspired at least one, perhaps 10,000, um, to wanna become scientists, to wanna become conservationists, to wanna become veterinarians or medical doctors or nurses or whatever it is. Um, and I have no doubt that this is a, an amazing place to, to tell those stories. And since then, it's actually been copied in several locations around the world, this idea of, of transparent medical care at a zoo or aquarium. Um, everybody likes big cats. And uh, so this is Dr. PK with one of our cheetahs. And again, the audience there in the back and the opportunity to not only provide excellent care, but to share stories of conservation and share why these animals are in trouble in the wild and what our guests can do to help them. It's not just the fluffy, cuddly critters. Everybody gets the same level of attention. This is Dr. Craig um, and working on one of our crocodiles here. And you can kind of see, if you look closely in the background, some children there against the window watching Dr. Greg Hart at work. There's also some really cool images on this slide of some of the technology that we have access to. Um, so we have a three-dimensional CAT scan capability right here at Disney's Animal Kingdom and the, abil the ability to do some pretty incredible and groundbreaking medical diagnostics, medical imaging. So you see a, a zebra skull up on the upper left. You see a, a reptile there in the middle. And then over on the right, um, if there's anybody that's ever experienced a kidney stone, and again, I don't know if my pointer shows up there, but that's what a kidney stone looks like under a CAT scan, um, that little that little white area on their x-ray up top and a little yellow area on the CT scan below. Um, we'll talk a little bit about sea turtles later, but our hospital also provides us the ability to provide a high level of care for rescue and rehabilitated animals. And that's a, that's a portion of our practice as well. Um, this is a three-dimensional CAT scan of a cold stunned sea turtle. And if I have any radiologists in the audience, veterinary or human radiologists, you might see that there, there, some, there are some small defects in the spine of this animal up on the, on the carapace, up on the top shell there. And uh, this animal actually was the victim of frostbite in a cold stun many years ago and lost a portion of its shell. But after two years in our hospital, um, actually survived and was released back into the wild. So a success story. And then a little sea turtle there on the right, um, it seems like we have a lot of pictures of our veterinarians looking into the eyes of our animals. Um, here's another example right there. So this is Dr. Deidre uh, with a Guam rail. Um, I mentioned the Micronesian kingfisher earlier, a highly endangered species. The Guam rail is also a highly endangered species from the island of Guam. And we've done a lot of work supporting that species over in the Pacific uh, portion of our world. And um, um, Deidre is very involved in, in these really cool ground dwelling birds that were decimated by the introduction of an exotic snake to the island of Guam. This picture I like because it's a combination of our hospital, our show space in the background with our guests in the background, and then Mindy there um, demonstrating her care um, for this animal that is in her care every day. So um, it just, it really well sums up the level of care and passion for all of the creatures here at Disney's Animal Kingdom and the seas uh, over at Epcot. And it extends backstage, not just on stage, a little piglet. And you know, how can you not take a picture of a piglet and find it to be extraordinarily cute? And so this is Juliana, one of our technicians uh, working with a, a little Red River hog piglet over at Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge. Now, I think when people think about animal care, they think immediately about some of the pictures that I've shown you, whether it's the veterinary side of things or the fluffy, cuddly side of things or the dangerous side of things. Um, but there is so much that goes in behind the scenes to caring for these, these animals. And one of the sort of the hidden gems that we like to talk about a lot is our nutrition program for our animals. And so this is Ben. Ben's been with us for a long time and he's preparing a diet for one of our animals, so obviously a, a vegetarian based diet for one of our animals. And, you know, the level of produce that is um, that is 
um, made available to our animals. We use all human quality food. Uh, we don't use any waste food for our animals. It's all of highest nutritional value sourced from the same sources as our Disney restaurants. And every animal in our care is delivered a diet that is prescribed down to within two grams uh, from a recipe perspective. So we know within plus or minus two grams what an animal is delivered every day uh, to maintain an I ideal body weight and ideal nutritional parameters. And all told here at Disney's Animal Kingdom, we produce about 10,000 pounds of food every day for our animals. So it's pretty incredible. All right, let's see what's next. And then the other piece of care is the incredible science that goes into animal care. And I probably could do a whole hour just on the scientific aspects of our care program, but I picked a few highlights there for you. Um, I'll start on the bottom there, the, the, the gross picture there, which is an artificial three-dimensionally printed rib cage that's been created. So it's not real bone there. That's actually a 3D printed rib cage that's been created so that we could appropriately feed this vulture and mimic a natural feeding circumstance. There's um, for lack of a better term, soft dog food that's pressed in between those rib bones, and it allows that vulture to forage with natural behaviors. Um, we use science to measure um, hormones, stress hormones, um, um, reproductive hormones. We use contraception in some cases with some of our animals, so we can measure the, the effectiveness of contraception. Um, we can measure breeding seasons. We can measure pregnancy so that we're ready to react if the pregnancy goes well or if it goes poorly. Um, we have nighttime experiences at Disney's Animal Kingdom, um, especially right now with our shorter days, there are some opportunities for nighttime experiences. Um, we measure light levels, we measure sound levels. Um, we manage animals in the middle, middle of a busy Disney theme park and we, we have sound parameters and light parameters to make sure that our animals are able, not only just comfortable, but able to thrive in these surroundings. And we put a lot of effort into making sure that indeed they do thrive in these surroundings. So there's an incredible background behind the care that you may see um, from an obvious perspective, whether it's the veterinary care or um, if you ride our safari and see our safari in action, there is so much expertise and so much dedication behind that that so many people don't know anything about. Um, but it's absolutely fascinating, yeah, even to me. And I get an update every month from my science team. So Several times I've mentioned our guests, and I think earlier I said, you know, that the reason we have the animals that we have here at Walt Disney World and our other sites is that we can, we can connect our guests to the magic of animals and nature. And so, and if you remember back to our mission, lead, care, connect, and conserve, that connect is a prominent word there because we want to connect our guests to nature, to animals, and inspire them to help us make the world a better place for animals, for people for habitats around the world. And so our cast members find so many great ways to have those connections um, through sharing their expertise or demonstrating how we care for animals, a pony ride and a connection to a young girl there. Um, and I wanna call out this, this little yellow and green and brown book there. You can see Wilderness Explorers and, and what's amazing about Wilderness Explorers, which is, which is literally a small, um, handbook that we, that we hand to guests for free when they come to Disney's Animal Kingdom, um, is that in this day and age of digital experiences and social media and screens, um, this is a good old fashioned workbook. And what we see is that this workbook has changed the way parents and children interact, and in some cases, just pure adults interact with our park. Um, because what we used to see before the days of Wilderness Explorers is the parents rushing from attraction to attraction and the kids lagging behind and you know late in the day in the summertime you start to get the the fatigue and the tears and with Wilderness Explorers what we now see is the kids leading the parents through the park and going from experience to experience talking with our amazing guides that you see there in the picture with the hat on the young lady and learning about animals and nature and having this tangible goal through their day in the park uh, to gather their badges, which are just little little stickers is all they are. Um, and we've actually made it quite hard to get all your stickers in one day, but it is possible. Um, but essentially we're sharing with you the magic of nature through 
good old fashioned pencil and paper and some stickers. And we've seen, uh, we've seen dramatic changes with our guests over the years as we've employed this great program. We tell stories to inspire. Um, we are a storytelling company and we have this incredible palette um, here at Disney's Animal Kingdom and at the Seas and at the Lodge and, and in other locations. And, you know, how can you not get caught up in stories of baby hippos like Augustus there or Anala and Jetta there, our baby tigers on the right? Um, it doesn't have to be babies. There's great stories with adults. There's great stories with everything, but, but babies make it easy, to be perfectly honest, and they make great pictures as well. And so being able, in the case of our tigers there, to tell the story of the Sumatran tiger and the fact that there are only 300 left on this planet and that we really need a concerted effort to save the forests in that area of the world so that these animals have a habitat and share with people that, you know, a very simple strategy is to use recycled paper and to make sure that you recycle your paper to try and save some of the forest um, areas of the world. Um, is, is a really great story to tell in a full circular story. So um, our animals give us the opportunity and the obligation to tell incredible stories. And then there's the magic. And you know there is something magical about our park um, here at Disney's Animal Kingdom. There's obviously something magical about the animals that inhabit our world and, and our park here. Um, this is an experience we call Winged Encounters, which is uh, the free flight of approximately 30-ish uh, macaws that fly around the tree of life there in the center of the park. And the best way to describe these animals um, is living fireworks. They're noisy, they're fast, they're agile. And when they weave and dodge between our guests and land in front of the tree of life, and there's a moment there of talking about conserving these birds in, in South America and around the world, and looking at their beauty and talking with guests about the fact that they actually don't make great pets. They're loud and they're messy and they live forever. Um, everything comes together in this little five minute experience. And when the birds leave the perch and they fly back to their home about a mile and a half back um, behind the tree there, um, it is a moment that brings people to tears. And again, if you, if you do come to Disney's Animal Kingdom, I hope you have the opportunity to experience it. And, um, and it is something that is truly magical. And, um, and it's one of my favorite experiences in the park. And, but there's so many. Um, picture upon picture upon picture upon picture. And originally, I just had slide after slide after slide. And uh, I was like, OK, I got to combine some of these, or Zach's going to yell at me for going way too long. Um, and so just more examples of the magic of nature, the magic of our cast, the magic of storytelling uh, throughout our park and really you know, what our main focus is. Um, and on and on and on. So I had to throw another little baby in there, another homage to the land there and some of our food production, um, telling the stories of humans and domestic livestock living in close proximity to, to wildlife and how people and animals can live together. Um, just stories after stories after stories. And, you know, I can't talk about Disney and I can't talk about our animals in our park without focusing on kids. Um, you know, kids and magic, Disney and families, Disney and kids all go together. And, and just a, a few examples. Um, we're excited as we're getting ready to relaunch our conservation day camp um, opportunities here and uh, opportunities that we bring kids and nature, kids and science in close proximity to one another. And you know, so there's Dr. Deidre there who you met earlier doing a, a little bandaging opportunity on a plush giraffe there. And um, you know, it's great for the kids and it's great for the cast. And, um, and who doesn't love the oxytocin inducing effects of uh, grooming a goat with a brush? Um, nothing, nothing could beat that. Um, or a chicken. You know, so doesn't again doesn't always have to be the fluffy, fluffy, cuddly mammals. It could be a chicken, um, an amazing animal as well. So, um, got to focus on the kids and the animals as part of who we are. And it happens in unexpected places. So this is Lauren, and Lauren is sharing uh, uh, our Purple Martin project, where we have gourd houses. Some of you may have Purple Martin houses in your backyard, or seen them in your community. And so Lauren is sharing some of our Purple Martin. 
uh, opportunities with the Epcot Flower and Garden Festival. So it even expands beyond the businesses that you would expect here at Walt Disney World. And, you know, sharing with children the magic of nature and the magic of birth and conservation and these incredible birds that make this long migration from South America up to Orlando and have their babies and then head back home. Um, a great connection to our South American friends and guests. And beauty and stories and two bachelor brothers that live together and uh, in this incredible place and, uh, and call Disney's Animal Kingdom home. And offspring that are produced to ensure the survival of a species forever and ever on our planet. So some of our baby gorillas. So that was animals first. Now the second half of the equation, if you remember back and there should be a test, I should have added a test in here. I told you there were two things that we have to do in order to make the world a better place. Animals first, conservation always. So I wanted to share with you some of the uh, the other half of the equation that we take really good care of the animals and we and we try and protect their counterparts and their habitats in the wild. And so um, I really like this statement, uh, animals first and conservation always. And uh, so I'll introduce you to one of the tools for our conservation focus, which is our Disney conservation program. Uh, really has two components to it, the Disney Conservation Fund, which is a granting fund that the Disney company has to provide grants to nonprofit organizations that really focus not only on animals, but on communities. We really focus our funding on scientific projects that, that protect animals, but also support the local community or involve the local community in conservation efforts. So there's, there's an animal and human side to both. And then our team wildlife down there in the lower right are, are the members of our team who do the actual work in the field, um, who go out and do the hard work and really help us protect animals, in many cases right here in our own backyard here in Florida, and I'll share with you some examples. Um, so our field conservation efforts, anywhere from butterflies in Vero Beach to sea turtles in Vero Beach to purple martins right here in Walt Disney World, monarch butterflies in California, and on and on and on uh, around the United States and around the world. And um, once again, I'm going to use the magic of YouTube and video to introduce you to the Disney Conservation Fund because I can't do it the justice that this video will. So um, watch another short video with me. They thrill us. Make us laugh. Aww. And make us cry. They make us think. She's beautiful. Inspire us. <laughs> and teach us. <laughs> Most importantly, they connect us to the world of nature. And right now, more than ever, they need us. Through our efforts here at the park at Disney's Animal Kingdom to share the stories and our efforts in the field to truly make a difference scientifically in the community and with the animals themselves, our end goal is that we truly make a difference for those animals in the wild. The Disney Conservation Fund is proud to celebrate and protect the wildlife we share our planet with. From our experiences and dedication to animal care, to our work to save wildlife and our support of conservation heroes. The Disney Conservation Fund is committed to ensuring a world where wildlife thrives and inspiring all of us to treasure and protect the magic of nature. We blend the love of nature and a respect for animals that Walt Disney always had himself with making dreams come true, getting people excited about nature and about being out in the wild. Every single one of us matters and has a role to play every single day we make a difference. Let's learn to live in peace and harmony between nations, cultures, religions, and between us and Mother Nature. At Disney, we're not just talking about helping the animals that share our planet, we're doing something about it. Join us by taking action in your own community to save wildlife, inspire action, and protect the planet. So once again, um, 
thank you to uh, our production partners because uh, they just tell the story so well. They, they stuck me in there, which is um, always fun to see myself on, on TV, but um, it's really about the message. And hopefully, hopefully you heard some of the messages that I've been sharing with you for the last 40 minutes uh, reinforced in that. And, you know, uh, I think this is my last Walt Disney quote. Um, I promised you there would be some. Um, and, uh, you know, conservation isn't just the business of a few people. It's a matter that concerns all of us and never has that been more true. And I think we're seeing that firsthand right now in the state of Florida with the manatee challenges that we have. And, um, and then we see it around the world with the challenges that we have, but we're really, really excited about some of the efforts that uh, we've been able to undertake and some of the goals and accomplishments. So as was said there in the video, and actually a couple of these numbers have gone up even since that video was produced. So our key accomplishments over the last 25 years with the Disney Conservation Fund, uh, now more than a thousand species protected across 121 country, 120 countries on our planet, $120 million of grants to nonprofit agencies that I mentioned earlier earlier. 50 million kids. I mentioned billions earlier. We're on our way. 50 million kids connected to nature and 315 million acres of land and waters protected globally. And I did, the, I did some rough math. Um, that's equivalent to several thousand Walt Disney World's, that 350 million acres. So uh, we're very, very proud of the accomplishments and putting our money and our, our efforts where our mouth is and um, the other half of the equation, care and conservation. This is the conservation side of it. And you know, back to this picture that I showed you earlier and, and my hope that this inspires this little girl and, and the obligation that we have to take this moment and actually do something with it. Um, and turn this into impactful science. And, and knowing the audience that I have on, on, online with me tonight, um, people who are interested in, in the marine environments, I just focused on sea turtles and coral a little bit, but um, we have a longstanding partnership with the University of Florida, which I'm very excited about, um, in which we have a number of sea turtle uh, focuses. Probably the most visible focus for our sea turtle program is our... Um, efforts on Disney's Vero, with Disney's Vero Beach Resort in the, in, the, in the city of Vero Beach, where we protect about two miles of coastline there in Vero Beach and monitor uh, for sea turtle hatchlings, as many organizations do. Um, lots of great work done by organizations up and down the Florida coast. Um, of course, this is the classic picture of a biologist un unearthing and you know, inventorying a sea turtle nest. And in this case at Disney's Vero Beach, uh, we have the, the permitting and the permissions to share some of these experiences with our guests at the Disney Vero Beach Hotel, um, to do beach walks with our guests and talk to them about our conservation stories. And we recently hit, actually I think it was last summer, we hit a milestone that we've inventoried our one millionth sea turtle on Disney's Vero Beach, uh, sea turtle hatchling. And so numbers like that truly are impactful and combine that with the number of guests that we've inspired through our efforts. Um, it's a win-win uh, for both sides. Uh, we've done very interesting things with sea turtles and I'm, I'm proud to say I was involved in one of the earliest efforts. Um, if any of you have spent any time on a sea turtle beach and digging those, uh, those nests uh, to try and inventory, it can be quite challenging. Um, this is Captain Ron, the little beagle, that, not the guy there, the little beagle there. Captain Ron was the world's first sea turtle detection dog that could help us, again, with appropriate permitting to find sea, sea turtle nests on the beach and uh, make, make life a little bit more efficient for, uh, for our biologists. Um, so not a program we continue, it was more of an experiment, but it did work, I will say that. And Captain Ron generated a lot of positive attention on the beach there. Um, and you know, ultimately uh, through our efforts with Tour de Turtles and again, other partner organizations, uh, you know, the idea of, of inspiring guests to see this amazing emergence of a mama sea turtle coming up, laying her eggs and then going back into the ocean um, what an incredible opportunity to inspire. And in this case, almost a million people watching online as our two sea turtles participated in Tour to Turtles and left the Disney Bureau Beach Resort to go back into the water. So um, something that we get excited about every year and sea turtle season's not too far away for us, as I'm sure many of you know. And corals in Bahamas, a lot of focus there for us, right in our own backyard. 
and uh, looking at things like climate, climate change and overfishing and uh, corals. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware, and I don't, um, Zach may have even had a lecture about the, the Florida Reef Tract and the efforts to save our coral populations right here off the coast of Florida. And Disney is a participating partner along with SeaWorld in a massive coral rescue effort that's happening right here in Orlando. So the Florida Coral, the Florida Reef Tract Rescue Center is right here in Orlando where hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of corals have been brought in to a rescue facility to ensure that we have corals to repopulate the reef um, depending on you know, how that potential disaster goes. Um, over the next few years. So big focus on coral for us. And then some of the other marine project examples around the world, again, I was trying to, trying to predict my audience here. Um, so um, a program called Reef Relief, which is uh, youth focused, working with IFA, the International Fund for Animal Welfare to look at protecting Northern white whales, um, working with sharks, um, again, in the Bahamas and uh, youth, the Marine Mammal Center out in California. And, um, and our strong focus on sea turtles. I mentioned manatees earlier. These, these are probably the worst two pictures I have uh, in my entire presentation because they're hot off the presses from just a few days ago, uh, releasing a manatee back into an area with, uh, in cooperation with Florida Fish and Wildlife. And uh, we, like many organizations in Florida, have gotten very involved in manatee rescue and rehabilitation over the last year or so. And in fact, we're getting ready to release another animal to tomorrow and uh, and then we'll get another animal into our rehab facility on Friday in all likelihood. So what a terrible tragedy to see the loss of seagrass in our coastal communities and the impact on manatees. Um, but trying to do everything we can in partnership with the state and the manatee rescue and rehab partnership to make a difference for these incredible animals. And you know we I'm going to keep going back to this model of you know, the animals here, at Disney's Animal Kingdom, and the way we care for them and the conservation impacts. So this is Stella. Stella's a baby elephant there. She actually doesn't look like this anymore because she's five years old and almost grown up. Um, but taking it to the conservation side, a really cool story. If you haven't heard about elephants and bees, I would encourage you to search for elephants and bees and uh, the Saving Elephants Organization. Um, imagine if you're a farmer in Africa and you feed your family from a small community farm and a herd of elephants comes through one night, breaks down your fences and eats your entire allotment of produce for the year for your family. Um, you have to feed your family. And so you may decide to do something dramatic like grab a gun or grab a box of poison and kill those elephants. Well, Save the Elephants in cooperation with Disney he came up with this amazing idea to develop in the upper left hand corner there, beehive fences. So now you can build a fence that is made of beehives that hang on little wires. You can probably see the little wires there. Again, if my pointer's working, um, an elephant comes by and bumps into the beehive and um, elephants aren't afraid of mice, all of the classic Disney cartoon. They actually are afraid of bees. And so the bees come out, they sting the soft parts on the elephant, the elephant runs away. Um, the farmer's crops are happy. The elephants are mildly unhappy until they get away from the bees. And then in the end, the farmer can also harvest the honey and sell it in local markets in Southern Africa. So these are a couple of our cast members. That's Dr. Joseph in the upper left and Ike kneeling down and Angela, one of my safari keepers um, who have all participated in the, in the Save the Elephants and Elephants and Bees programs. Just a, a super cool story that all comes back here to Disney's Animal Kingdom. And I showed these baby gorillas earlier. I, they're, they're sort of a special place in my heart for, uh, for Corey and Flint and, and Ada, um, our babies there. And another special place in our, my heart is in the Democratic Republic of Congo and this amazing facility called Grace. Um, we actually have a baby gorilla named Grace, uh, the Gorilla Rehabilitation and Conservation Education Center, a place where in this terribly unstable portion of the world, we're able to rescue baby gorillas from the poaching practices from the bushmeat crisis to bring these animals into a sanctuary that was almost entirely built by Disney's, by the Disney company and by our team to house these gorillas, to provide care for these gorillas so that one day they could be um, uh, reintroduced back into the wild. Uh, the woman on the right there is Dr. Natalie Milichinko, who's got an office just 30 feet away behind me here. And Dr. Natalie is a veterinarian that has dedicated her life to going to the Congo um, when travel allows to help. Uh, this is actually a pre-COVID picture. They're wearing a mask, not for COVID, but for just for the gorilla's protection. 
and uh, help save these gorillas in the wild. It's a terribly difficult place to get to um, and terribly dangerous, but Natalie goes every year to help these animals. And it's just a great example of the dedication. So animals first, care, inspiration, storytelling, and conservation always. Making a difference in the field, making a difference with communities, with kids, with families, um, with economies, and um, it really is a winning combination. Really quickly, I, I can't talk about conservation without talking about natural resource conservation. And, and you know, I've, I've shared with you exciting pictures from Africa and from far afield, um, but there's equally exciting things going here, right here at Walt Disney World. And um, making sure that you're aware that the Disney company has set uh, environmental targets. Actually, we just completed our first set of environmental targets in 2020 where we were looking to conserve water resources, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and focus on waste in our parks. Um, we were actually able to achieve all of the goals that are listed on these slides. Um, and in some cases achieve them by wide margins, something that we're very, very proud of. Um, you may have seen pictures of our focus on solar here at Walt Disney. And we now, uh, like I mentioned earlier, have a tremendous solar capacity um, that may even grow more and more over time. And, um, and then this is, this is out there if you're interested uh, and you wanna search 2030 Disney environmental goals, this information's out there. But we've now set some very aggressive goals for ourselves for 2030. We, we truly do take this idea of conserving uh, seriously. And so we are focused on emissions. We are focused on our oceans and waters, our waste, our materials that we use in construction and in our, in our consumer products and on how we design our theme parks and resorts. And there are so many stories, again, another hour, another time from composting to sustainable seafood, to food donations, to even reducing the plastics that are used in packaging of some of our classic Disney toys um, so that we're not wasting all of that material uh, in our consumer products. So, so many stories, so many stories. Um, Zach's gonna kill me if I don't end up here pretty quick, um, but I'm gonna bring it all back home one more time, this idea, here at Epcot at our one of our theme parks of sharing the stories of the magic of nature and animals, of doing the work in the field to truly study and save these animals and to create that connection that is so powerful and so important for us all. Thank you so very much for listening to me ramble for almost an hour. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to the questions that you have for me. Thank you, thank you so much. Scott, that was that was just so awesome. It's really neat to see what's going on behind the scenes with, with Disney, and I, I think our viewers tonight will have a much better understanding of what Walt Disney is doing to conserve the environment, to protect the animals that are, you know, in one moment, ambassadors on stage at one of your theme parks, and at the next moment, being you know, conserved in a wild setting. So I, I think it was a really neat opportunity for you to get to share your story with our guests. And already the questions are rolling in. I would encourage all of you to, to fire away, start typing those questions in. We'll, uh, we'll do our very best to, to get to them as we go. And I hope all of you will stick around. I know most of you typically stick around for the Q&A session. We have some good questions already in queue tonight. So I, I think uh, I would encourage you to stick around for a little bit as we talk. So our first question is about rehab. You talked a little bit about sea turtle rehab and manatee rehab. Are, are guests wondering whether you have a specific wild animal rehab facility? And if so, what other animals do you work with in a rehab setting to try to return them back out into the wild? So um, sort of a, a, I don't know if I changed the slide accidentally there. Um, yes and no. So we don't have a publicly available wildlife rehab facility. We do have pretty significant wildlife rehabilitation capabilities here at Walt Disney World. Walt Disney World is about 36,000 acres of land, about 25 square miles. And so we have a very robust wildlife population here at Disney. So uh, most of our rehab efforts other than sea turtles and manatees and things like that are focused on native wildlife right here at Walt Disney World. So, so we do a lot of the traditional bird and bunny and squirrel and um, uh, sandhill crane, white-tailed deer uh, work right here at Walt Disney World. And we work with some local rehabilitators in the central Florida area to help us with that as well. Um, so yes, we do a fair bit of wildlife rehab. Um, it's not really a publicly available facility, um, and really, 
this year, a lot of our energy with wildlife rehab has, has gone to the manatees and the manatee crisis and continues, like I said, real time uh, tomorrow and Friday. All right, your, your comment about acreage is a good lead into our next question. How many acres of land does Disney devote to food production to feed the animals that you care for? <laughs> um, so we have the luxury here at Disney's Animal Kingdom. You know, we live in this wonderful Central Florida climate where things grow really well. Uh, we have about 100 acres of land that is specifically dedicated to uh, growing what we call browse, which is just a zoo term for fresh, fresh vegetation. So we grow willow and acacia and, um, oh, my nutritionist is going to shoot me for not being able to, uh, to go for a longer list, but uh, banana um, and several other types of plants that we actually harvest on a daily basis. We have a, um, a company that harvests our vegetation. It's actually not too far from here, uh, right out the back door of Disney's Animal Kingdom. And we're able to deliver this fresh vegetation to the animals, which is not only fantastic nutritionally, but also behaviorally for a lot of our animals that browse and graze. Um, it provides us an opportunity to provide them a very natural diet. So it is a wonderful luxury that we have that, um, you know, for a northern zoo, you have to you have to ship this stuff in. For us, we can literally go out the back gate and get it. It's very nice. One of our viewers wonders a question that probably a lot of folks have on their mind. How does Disney acquire the magnificent and oftentimes very large specimens for its exhibits? Yeah. So I, I mentioned earlier that we're a member of the AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So uh, we do not, uh, modern zoos, um, and, and we in particular, we do not acquire animals from the wild. Um, we are working in cooperative programs with other zoos, um, like Disney's Animal Kingdom, um, to uh, cooperatively manage these animals through what are called SSPs, Species Survival Plans. So those are plans uh, that look at genetics and um, social patterns to make sure that we have a population of animals in North American zoos and actually international zoos that can thrive. And so um, there is no purchasing, selling. Um, it's all done through a cooperative management program and it's all exchange and interchange among AZA accredited zoos, the vast majority of them. All right. Um... Kind of a neat question. We've all been to zoos and aquariums and seen non-captive birds that visit your facility. So somebody is wondering how Disney deals with migrating birds who are not part of your cast, but they that set up shop or decide to stop over at Disney during this era of, of bird flu concerns. <laughs> I wondered if somebody would get to that. Uh, we very rare. Savvy, we have some pretty savvy, savvy yeah. viewers tonight. Um, yeah, bird flu is keeping me up at night a little bit. The avian influenza, I should say, is keeping me up at night a little bit right now. But I, I will say that uh, we're very aware of the of what's going on in the eastern United States right now and, uh, and preparing for it. Uh, the simple answer is uh, we can't control it. Um, they are native wildlife. In many cases, they are protected native wildlife. We respect them just like we respect the animals in our care. Um, we do have ways we can discourage interactions with feeding practices and um, things like that. But the fact of the matter is, is there is some interaction and we have to manage that risk. We have to be aware of that risk. Um, but um, we, we have to respect those animals. This is, we've created an amazing environment for, for them here at Walt Disney World. Um, as I said earlier, we have, we have tremendous populations of native wildlife that, that use our property. We have 8,000 acres of land that Walt Disney himself set aside as natural lands that will never be developed here at Walt Disney World. So it is part of, it is part of the overall complexity of managing a, a large outdoor zoological collection and we very much have our eyes on avian influenza and our our partners to the north and um fingers crossed but we're ready if it happens scott i, I don't want to steal the stage but I, I think that's a funny question i just had a facebook memory today i was at palm beach zoo a few years ago and we were eating lunch and a satellite tagged ibis showed up eating french fries at the zoo so this is a prime example of a, a visitor to the zoo that may bring with it some uh, some unwelcome yeah. bad guys. Yeah, and that's that's a good example of working with our guests and our cast members to make sure that you know we don't feed the animals. Number one, it's not good for the animals, and number two, it's not good for these interactions that we were just talking about. So tonight, you talked a lot about 
breeding activities. And, and this guest wonders whether animals on Disney properties, whether they're actively encouraged to breed, whether they're actively discouraged to breed. You talked about contraception. How and why do you make those choices? What animals are encouraged to breed versus you know, being discouraged to breed? Is it mm -hmm. species specific? Is it related to their endangered species status? Are all animals painted with the same brush? Wow, what a complex question. Um, and the answer is yes, no, all of the above. Um, so, so all breeding decisions are made um, very intentionally. So, um, and, and no breeding decisions are made purely for the purpose of producing babies. You know, that's one of the risks when I show you lots of cute baby pictures, I, I certainly wouldn't want anybody to think that we make that we're making babies for the sake of making babies. All of our populations are managed through, again, what I called earlier, the SSPs, the Species Survival Plans. And those are very, very scientifically controlled plans that look at genetics and inbreeding and look at target population goals. And some species like Sumatran tigers that I mentioned, where there are very few animals in the wild, very few animals in zoos, um, there is a focused effort to try and breed um, uh, those populations. There may be other populations of animals where there's less focus on it. So, um, uh, you know, so the goats that we have on in our African safari, um, you know, certainly not a conservation priority for us. And so we may look at different efforts. With some species of primates, um, you have to take in social um, interactions as part of the equation. So um, making sure that the right animals are breeding so as to not to create conflict in a, in a situation between mom, different moms or mom and dad um, in those scenarios. So there are a lot of, there are many, many decisions that go into every breeding. Um, similarly, there are many decisions that go into contraception. Um, we don't take contraception lightly. We do use contraception. Um, we use human-like contraceptions in several of our primates um, and all monitored by our veterinary team. Um, but, you know, contraceptions aren't completely benign. And so a lot has got to be focused on that to make sure that we're still doing right by the animal and the population. Um, you know, and this is a really good example of where, you know, animals first really does apply. You know, everything's got to be taken first from the perspective of how is this going to impact this individual animal. And I feel like as long as we start the conversation there and then make the right decisions, um, some of these complex decisions about breeding and populations, um, we work with a program, Puerto Rican Crested Toads, where we're looking to reintroduce Puerto Rican Crested Toads to Puerto Rico. And uh, we breed the heck out of those little guys and uh, are very proud of it. But um, there are other populations here at Disney's Animal Kingdom or over at the seas. Um, that we manage as, as stable populations. So it's a, it's a really, really good, but complicated question. So related to that, a, another guest wonders whether animals that are, that are born on Disney properties are ever released back out into the wild or whether they're always kept at a Disney facility for the yep. rest of their life. Um, both. So um, there are populations of animals that we manage um, as healthy, thriving populations from a zoo perspective. There are populations, I just referred to one, that we are breeding specifically to reintroduce into the wild. It's, the majority is actually the former. So um, just, you know, be perfectly honest and transparent with everybody is, you know, not every species in the zoo is destined for reintroduction. There are some really good examples. Um, probably another wonderful example is we have, uh, in our history, reintroduced two white rhinos back to Uganda, who have gone on to sire one, two, almost three generations of rhinos uh, beyond our original two introductions. Um, so there are targeted populations that are, and, and certainly at other zoos with other species, where zoos are really making a difference for animals in the wild. Um, but, but we also have animals that were really focused on creating a healthy, thriving population in zoos so that we can inspire our guests. And also, always in the back of our mind is the idea of an insurance population if something truly terrible were to happen. So uh, the Micronesian kingfishers that I mentioned earlier, um, at one point in our history, there were 60 to 80 of those birds left on the planet. And so us having 30 of them um, represented you know, almost half the world's population of those birds. And if, you know, if something dramatic had happened, uh, making sure that we can um, have an assurance population for future generations. And that's uh, a perfect lead into our next question. So in addition to the Micronesian kingfishers, the Guam rails, Sumatran tigers, lowland gorillas, and now you added white rhinos and, and Puerto Rican crested toads, 
what other critically endangered animal species has Disney successfully produced in captivity? Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> um, you know, we, we do tremendous work with several bird species beyond some of the ones that, that I notice in my, again, I'm kind of hoping some of my team's not watching me tonight um, uh, because they're going to be mad at me for not pulling examples out. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm going to purposely diversify, you know, uh, we've done some work with Parchula snails, this incredible little snail um, that was being re reintroduced into, I believe it was Fiji at one point. Um, I may be wrong on the destination there. Um, we have Hartman's Mountain Zebras uh, here at Disney's Animal Kingdom that are the most critical, critically endangered of the subspecies of zebras. Um, you know, on and on, I'm trying to think of some, um, I'm trying to diversify my, uh, my taxonomic base here and some of our work with um, black blotch rays at the seas and successful breeding of some ray species over there, spotted eagle rays um, as well. So um, again, most of our breeding focused on producing healthy, thriving populations for our zoo and aquarium collections. But at the same time, when there's an opportunity to make those reintroductions into the wild, when, when the right habitat's available, when the right politics are in place, when the right resources are there to support it, um, we're there to help where we can. All right, switching gears a little bit. Uh, what is your overall long-term approach towards animal care and conservation in light of climate change? You talked a little bit about climate change during your program, but yeah, probably say more. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I think I think that's where it comes to this, you know, this platform that we have to educate and inspire people. And so I think as we are able to tell climate change stories with regard to coral. Um, and potentially, you know, examples, you know, perhaps some of the things that are happening with the Florida Reef Tract are related to climate change or acidification issues or sea level changes with our beaches in Vero Beach and sea turtles and the impacts, you know, that Vero Beach, if, if you're not aware, many of you are probably aware, is one of the most important sea turtle nesting beaches in the world, not in the United States, not in Florida, but in the world. Uh, producing tremendous amounts of sea turtle nesting opportunities. Um, and so I think, you know, for me, and the reason why I like talking to groups like this is a lot of people have no idea of what's going on behind the scenes here, what Disney is trying to do um, with issues that could be impacted with issues like climate change. We have this incredible platform that if people trust us and, um, you know, and participate with us, uh, we work together whether it's scientific actions with Florida Oceanographic or guest actions that we teach and commit in the park, you know, we, ha we have this incredible platform to use to share those issues, to share potential solutions. So, um, you know, we really do focus on what our guests can do, small actions. Um, you know, you ride our safari and at the end of the safari, our safari drivers will tell you, you know, how to recycle your electronics so that you can um, help uh, lessen the impact of uh, the mineral coltan on small electronics trade. You can, we talk about water conservation. We talk about recycling. We talk about all these these issues that if if we even if we get to just a percentage of our guests, um, we have such an opportunity here to make an impact on some of these issues that are important to all of us. So we have a couple of people asking about seagrass. Um, you talked about coral restoration. So one guest is wondering whether Disney's also involved in similar efforts when it comes to restoring seagrasses in the Indian River Lagoon system, both from a restoration perspective and also like a research and science perspective. So I don't have any details for you. Um, and I actually only, uh, you know, Zach and I were actually chatting a little bit about this earlier. I'm a, I'm a fisherman, so I've seen firsthand the uh, um, in addition to our work with the manatees. Um, I know that our Disney conservation, I actually did an interview earlier for television earlier today. And um, so our Disney conservation team had provided me some, uh, some numbers that we've actually funded about 15 nonprofit organizations that are, that are helping with uh, habitat related issues uh, related to the manatee. Uh, crisis that's going on, including some seagrass restoration efforts. But, um, you know, I think my, my concern with some of the seagrass is just understanding what the root cause of, of the loss of seagrass is. And um, so right now, our major focus is on the animals themselves. Um, but the Disney Conservation Fund is, is a wonderful resource for nonprofit organizations that are truly trying, you know, to make a difference, especially right here in our backyard. 
going off in a little bit of a different direction, how do you prepare your parks for a hurricane? <laughs> I got a manual about that thick. Um, <laughs> so I've been here since 1999 and I've been in Florida my entire life, as I mentioned. So I've been through a lot of them, but Charlie, Jean and Francis, you all remember the, the big year. Um, so I'm very proud that we've experienced, um, we have experienced several hurricanes here, um, including a category four direct hit with Charlie. And um, uh, we've essentially never lost an animal to a hurricane situation. Um, I say essentially because we, I think we did have one little fledgling bird that um, was lost in a nest during one of the storms, but we actually have housing, uh, indoor category five rated housing for pretty much every animal that you see when you come and visit us here in Orlando. Um, so we have the ability to bring our animals into protected housing. Um, we have the the backup generators and the resources. And, and we actually have, again, it, it comes down to people. I have a portion of my team that, that has volunteered to ride out the storm and has proven that time and time and time again, where they will actually spend the, spend the time here. Um, and it seems like with every storm, that time gets longer and longer. Um, last storm, I think we were here for 36 hours straight. Um, so that if traffic systems were interrupted or uh, food deliveries were interrupted that we would have the resources on site um, to care for the animals, even if there was a major dis disruption in our infrastructure. And so, so it's a combination of good planning, good facilities, and great people. And, um, and actually, at the beginning of every summer, we stockpile a month's worth of food for every animal in, in our care. Um, so even in a worst case scenario, we would hope that we wouldn't see more than a month's supply chain interruption from a hurricane. And I lived through Hurricane Andrew down south, so I have some experience with that. We've uh, we've had a couple of different people ask questions about COVID, not so much in, in terms of operating a business, but in terms of the animals. So yeah. kind of summarizing multiple questions. Have you had any issues with animals under your care uh, becoming infected with, with COVID-19? So um, I don't think it's any secret out there that zoo animals have been impacted by COVID, um, especially big cats. Um, big cats have been are very susceptible to COVID um, and um, particularly snow leopards um, are very susceptible to COVID and there's been some mortalities with snow leopards. We don't have snow leopards here. Uh, we had a very mild case in, in, in a tiger um, uh, earlier on in COVID and, um, but she did fine through it. Um, I can also share as many zoos have shared that uh, many of our animals are vaccinated against COVID. There is a veterinary vaccine that was developed by uh, a veterinary pharmaceutical company um, that we've been able to vaccinate all of our high-risk animals against COVID. Um, uh, so to date, the one case in the tiger, which was about a 24-hour case, um, is our only case. And that animal was able to be isolated in a backstage area where it was no risk for people or uh, other animals, really for the other animals. And uh, we're actually very proud of how we uh, have managed our animal through COVID and our staff through COVID. And, um, but I think like many of you, it, is, it has been a very difficult two years emotionally and physically. And, um, and so I, I'm very proud that we've continued to do all this great work that I shared with you tonight through um, you know, through something that's been so impactful on all of us, all of you on this call and, and myself as well. So we seem to have a, a bunch of students watching tonight, both uh, college students who are interested in pursuing a career in, in zoology or wildlife care, as well as younger students. So let me try to fire a few of these questions out at you. Uh, does Disney offer scholarships or internships for people who wish to pursue degrees in animal care or conservation? So Disney has a very robust uh, college program. So, um, so again, you know, I keep telling everybody to go search things, but if you search Dis Disney's college program, they have a number of college programs. And then there are some, there are some stepping stones from there for some of our college age kids. Um, one of the things that was disrupted by COVID was some of our internship programs that were still in the process of looking at when the right time to return those, those programs are, are for our business. Um, from an overall safety and performance perspective. But um, Disney st still does have you know, several opportunities from a college program's perspective that can be stepping stones into a career. Um, I would say that there are, you know, one of the things about Florida is there are several accredited zoos and aquariums in, in Central Florida and in Florida. 
Um, so there may be volunteer. We're a for-profit company, so volunteerism is not really a thing for us. Um, uh, you can't volunteer for us, but there are other zoos and aquariums that have volunteer opportunities. I would encourage the Brevard Zoo um, right there in Melbourne is a, is a wonderful uh, zoo run by some very good friends of mine. And um, so, you know, when I speak with young people about wanting to work someday in the zoological profession or in the veterinary profession, it really is about getting some level of experience to the real world care of animals um, and essentially, you know, proving that that it's something that you want to do. It's a it's a it's a difficult job. It's emotionally challenging. It's physically challenging. It's immensely rewarding. Um, you got to have good grades. You got to go to school. Um, most of my cast um, that works on our team um, have a four-year degree in biology or zoology uh, from a university. Um, and then of course, uh, from a veterinary perspective, there's a whole nother layer there that um, uh, that's a great conversation with a young person as well. So we have a middle school student who's specifically interested in marine science, and they're wondering what kind of jobs are available at Disney that marine biologists fill. Ah, um, several. So, uh, so, so um, I think a lot of people think about zookeepers when they think about zoos. Well, I have a I have a, a role on my team called an aquarist, and they're basically a zookeeper for our aquarium team. And so, we have several marine science professionals that are members of our aquarium team that take care of the animals that. Um, you know, one of the cool things about being a zookeeper underwater is you get to put on dive equipment and go underwater, which is pretty awesome. Um, so, you know, a wonderful career. Um, on our conservation team, uh, we have a marine scientist, Dr. Andy Stamper, um, who does some really, he drives our coral programs. Uh, we have Dr. Rachel, who um, uh, drives our sea turtle program. And, um, and then we, we actually have educators on our team that work both at Animal Kingdom and at the seas that are responsible for that connection between our guests and our animals. Um, and many of them have marine science or, or zoology degrees as well. So there are a number of different types of roles um, that somebody with a marine science background can achieve. The other thing that people forget about from a marine science perspective, and this goes to that, you know, you got to do do well in school, is we have a number of chemists that work on our team. Uh, managing a body of water that is almost six million gallons, like we have at the seas, requires some pretty incredible chemistry uh, knowledge. And so, so if there's any students out there that have a have a real passion for chemistry, um, there's a future in our business for you as well. One more student question. So. Do you have any recommendations for a college student who's already pretty far along in her trajectory to get more involved and, and maybe get a foot in the door into a position at a, at a either a, a Disney property or any AZA type facility? Um, well, if, if, if the degree program that they're pursuing is a, a, you know, applicable, a biology, zoology, marine type of degree, um, most zoos and aquariums are going to jump at somebody with that four-year degree and, and, and the passion and the desire. Um, for us, there's that traditional route is to get the degree and then apply for an entry-level position. But the other, the other route um, is our college program route. So I would encourage you to look into the Disney college program. It is more of that entry-level exposure to the Disney company. But from there, once you've got your foot in the door, that opens up lots and lots of opportunities internally within the company to uh, become a member of our team. And so um, there are many of our most successful leaders that, that started their Disney journey in the Disney college program. And um, the vice president of Disney's Animal Kingdom started her journey as a Disney college program student. So um, um, it's a great way to get your foot in the door and learn some really great skills guest experience and teamwork that will benefit you in any job, no matter where you are in your future. We have time for one last question. I, I, this is kind of a, a fun one. Hopefully you can answer it. Um, what is the scariest or weirdest animal encounter you've personally experienced in your time at Disney? Oh, um, well, I, I will tell you. So I'm going to go back to my days as a veterinarian. And, uh, you know, the animal that I was always most nervous being close to, even under anesthesia, um, was our tigers. And, you know, there, there are these beautiful, large cats that, even though sleeping peacefully for a dental procedure or for a routine checkup, 
you know have the tools and the desire to eat you. Uh, and so there was always a sense of tension and nervousness and, and we're practicing medicine in front of that window that I shared with you all. So you're, you're, you're practicing in front of a large group of people and, um, and this animal that's on the table for you, not only responsible for its life, but it could take your life if you were to do something wrong. And so the level of expertise and professionalism goes into that, um, you know, um, uh, from a, from a strain, I'll, I'll stick to the hospital environment. I remember doing one time doing a preventative exam, a routine checkup on a, on a rat. Yes. On a rat. Um, we had some education animals in our, uh, in our collection and, uh, he did wake up from anesthesia, uh, luckily not a tiger, um, and managed to crawl up into that exam table that I showed you. Um, you know, he's a rat so they can get in little tiny holes. So he woke up from anesthesia, crawled into the table. Um, well, what are we going to do? Um, there are no curtains, there are no drapes, like I mentioned. So we proceeded to disassemble the entire table right there in front of our guests over the next two hours um, to make sure that 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 little guy didn't get hurt in the process of uh, getting him back where he needed to be. So um, the hospital is probably where I experienced the most um, most danger, the most excitement, um, sadness in some cases, joy in many cases, and uh, um, sort of the snapshot of the whole business. Awesome, Scott. Well, thank you again. This has been such a such a cool way to spend an evening. I, I had a blast. I know our audience did. We Believe it or not, we still have well over 100 people who stuck around to the very, very end. For those of you who, whose questions didn't get answered, I apologize. We just had way more questions than we had time uh, for answering, but we, we did our best to cover a broad cross-section of the types of questions we had. For those of you who haven't registered for next week's lecture, make sure you go online and sign up. We hope to see you here again next Tuesday and the Tuesday after that and the Tuesday after that, we still have a couple of more presentations ahead and I hope to see all of you there. Scott, thank you again. And to everybody who joined us tonight, thank you. Have a good night, everyone.